our scripture this morning is Leviticus chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 1 and go through verse 17. And while you turn and look for that in your pew Bible, it's found on page 102. While you turn and look for that, um, I just want to make a note that Leland Isaiah Cooper is in the house. And his first sermon he's heard in person will be from Leviticus. I, they couldn't be prouder parents at this moment. Again, that's Leviticus chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There it's written, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the coat on him. And tied the sash around his waist, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him, and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastplate on him, and in the breastpiece he put the Urim and the Thummim, and he set the turban on his head. And on the turban, in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes around their waist and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering and he killed it. And Moses took the blood and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull and its skin and its flesh And its dung he burned up with fire outside the camp, as the Lord commanded Moses. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. If you would, please join me in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One thing that we can take notice of if we, if we pay just a little bit of attention to history is, is how us as a society in the United States has, has moved and made changes through the centuries. We, we began as, as what was an agrarian society. We were very much farmers and hunters and gatherers here in this land. And, and, but quickly comes the Industrial Revolution, where we become an industrialized nation, and, and we're working in factories, and we're making parts and machinery and things of that nature. But now we have uh, made this turn, this turn into a more technical society as technology continues to advance at an exponential rate, and in doing so, we have become actually a customer service society, right? If you think about it, there used to be a time and point in our history where we took care of most of the things that had to do with our lives and our houses ourselves, 
But now, as technology increases, uh, as, as wealth increases as well, and as well as um, expertise increases, we begin farming out specialties of different areas of our lives. And some of it's because time and money, it just makes sense, and others it's because of knowledge and skill base and ability. Right, Our internet goes out, and the most we know how to do is to go to the router, unplug it, count for 10 seconds, plug it back in. So when we call Comcast, we tell them, yes, we already did that step, right? And then they help us through because someone else has the knowledge and the skill base to get us through that. Uh, but long before that happened, we moved from changing the oil in our cars in our own garages to going to the Jiffy Lube where we could get it done in 15 minutes. Because when we did it at our house, by the time we got the car actually jacked up, found where the oil filter was, pulled the drain plug, got all dirty and oily under there, and then at the end had to figure out where to pour that oil out, it was way longer than 15 minutes. And so we figured, you know what, I could save a lot of time by spending a little bit of money. But it just continued progressing, didn't it, right? We, we've gotten to the point where, you know, we want coffee. So instead of making coffee from our coffee pot at home, we choose one of the 17 coffee locations here at the beach. And we can drive through or sit down, and more than likely, they'll make their coffee from the same kind of beans and the same kind of coffee pot we have at our house. But it's gotten even better, folks. As a proud father of three I'll tell you that technology has drastically changed my life in a way that I couldn't be happier. I can sit in my couch and I can watch a television show and while doing so, realize we have no groceries and I don't have to get up. I get on the app, I tell the grocery app what we need and someone delivers it to my door. We are a customer service. We have other people doing things for us, things we normally would have done. Now, here in Scripture, we, we've entered chapter 8 of Leviticus, and, and what God began at the beginning of Leviticus in the first seven chapters was create this sacrificial system. Right? He creates this sacrificial system, this offering system, where there's burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, animal offerings, unblemished lamb offerings, go find two turtle doves and a partridge and a pear tree offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, which what is really the difference between those two? And created this system. And now that the system's in place for God's people, here in chapter 8, he begins by creating a priesthood, someone, a part of the, God's people that will mediate their sacrifices to God so that their legal standing with God, so that continuing to be God's people goes on as long as it's mediated by the priesthood. Now, the priesthood will come from the tribe of Levi, which Moses and Aaron are a part of. And what we heard in the scripture today is we, we saw and, and we listened and we heard Moses ordain Aaron as the high priest and his two sons as priests. This is the priesthood here in the beginning, and they're, and, they're, and they're Levites. And so they're not allowed to have any land or any real property. They're going to live off of whatever is offered and brought to the tabernacle for sacrifice. Now, we know the burnt offering they get nothing from, but other offerings they get to glean parts of it as part of a payment to sustain this priesthood. And so God creates a sacrificial system so that his people, because he's holy and just, so that he can withstand them being his people and he can go into their very presence. But he doesn't quite go in their very presence the way um, he once did in the garden, right? They've, he had them create and, and build this tabernacle, this tent of meeting. Now, this would be the place where in the Holy of Holies, in a specific area of it, that God would dwell amongst his people. And once a year, the high priest on the Day of Atonement may enter into that space. That is how God has chosen, a holy and just God has chosen to interact with a sinful and rebellious people, but who are his people. And so that's where he's going to dwell among them. Now, I know all of you are very familiar with the technical dimensions of the tabernacle, correct? Right? We covered that 
before at some point. But anyway, if you're unfamiliar with it and, and you forget because it's not something we carry around in our back pocket, the whole, uh, the whole part of the tabernacle, including its courtyard, which is fenced in or, or curtained in, is about a third of the size of a uh, football field, an American football field. So about a third of that size, and, and that's the outside gate which creates the courtyard. And the gate would be on the east, and the tabernacle, the tent itself, the tent of meeting, would be located within the western part of the courtyard. Now, if you're an Israelite, you're one of God's people, you get to go in the courtyard. You get to bring your sacrifice, you get to bring your offering, and give it to the priest there in the courtyard. You can gather in the courtyard and hear from other priests and and rabbis and hear them talk. But most of the time, you didn't really go in the courtyard unless it was necessary. And then there's the tent of meeting, the actual tabernacle itself. And the priests, right, they can go into the tabernacle. They take your offering and your sacrifice. They go in there and do what needs to be done. And God's justice is satisfied. But they couldn't go into all of the tabernacle. They couldn't go into every part of the tent of meeting. For remember, there's that holy of holies. That's where God dwelt, and that took up about a third of the tent of meeting. And and there was a curtain that divided that section of the tent of meeting from the rest of the tabernacle, which only the priest could go into, right? So there's kind of a, a class of people that God allows in his presence, and, and this is important because we didn't grow up in this Jewish system where we didn't have access to God, right? You want to pray to God? You want to confess your sins? Well, you bring your lamb with you to the priest. And the priest does everything for you. You don't have the lamb? Get the two turtle doves. You don't have the turtle doves? What does it say? Get the pigeons. You don't have the pigeons? Get an ephah, a flower. Figure out that measurement and conversion system on your own. But that's what it took. That's what God required. A holy and just God set apart priest who would be consecrated, who had sin offerings for them so that they, on sinner's behalf of God's people, could go and continue to please God and, and make things right from their sin. But their offerings, their sacrifices... It would only last for a moment until you realized your next sin. Or every year until the day of atonement came around and the high priest got to go into the Holy of Holies with the sacrifice that was for all of God's people that wouldn't have to be done for one whole year. You would be right with God and you would be his people again for another year. And then it all changed. It all changed, and and we read about it in Scripture, but we don't always make a big note of it. See, it changed as Jesus hangs upon the cross. And it's there as he's hanging on the cross, and he breathes his last breath. The Scriptures tell us, and the curtain was torn in two. See, this this, this this is a big deal, because... The curtain being torn in two, they're in the temple now. So the temple is just a a permanent placement of the tabernacle. Same dimensions of of the tabernacle in in the same Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence is. So there's a curtain there. Only the high priest can go in. Still only the high priest in the temple. Jesus dies and that curtain is torn. Do you know what this means? It means that everyone who was a priest at that time that got to go inside the actual temple could now be, they were technically within the Holy of Holies because the curtains torn wide open. It, you know, they just made that room an open concept all of a sudden, right? They took down that wall and now priests are in the presence of God, his dwelling for the first time in history since the garden has moved beyond the Holy of Holies and is now inhabiting other spaces for his people. So there's priests that that are in there in the very presence of God. And you say, Pastor, this is is great. This is wonderful. And and I'm sure those priests had had a very nice time before the temple was destroyed in the year 70. But what does that have to do with us? Well, it has a lot to do with us. Because of Jesus' death, Peter writes, 
in, in his first letter, in the second chapter, he writes there, he says, you yourselves are like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. You're part of the priesthood. Because of what Christ has accomplished, you're part of the priesthood. This means that those that had access to the tabernacle And when the curtain is torn, are now get to go in the presence of God and mediate their own relationship with God because of Christ and what he has done in satisfying God's justice. That curtain was torn and you, dear Christian, get to go before God, our Father and Creator, yourself. There is no man or woman on earth that will ever need to mediate that for you. You get God. God's justice has been satisfied, not momentarily, but eternally because of Christ. See, there's great similarities between us and the priesthood when we really look at this. When we look at what happened to Aaron and his sons on this very first ordination, we see that they are washed and they are clothed and they are anointed and they are redeemed. Because right? they put their head on that bull, which was the sin offering. And for you, who are part of this holy priesthood, when you're baptized, you are washed by the water. You are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You are anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you are redeemed by his sacrifice. For Jesus is our sin offering, given on behalf of us by God himself. Our God, who who couldn't stand to be in our presence because of our rebellion, because we're at enmity with him, because of our sin, finds the offering himself, the perfect Offering the perfect sacrifice, his son, an unblemished, unstained life by sin, and he lives it and dies and sheds his blood. And upon his last breath, the curtain is opened. And you are part of the royal priesthood. And that's great. Because like the priesthood, we're we're chosen by God, we're cleansed from our sin, we're clothed for service, we're anointed with great power, we're, we're prepared for the work, we're called to obedience and to be submissive to his word. That's what the priests were called to do. They they were called to give their whole lives over to God. Everything they had was because it was brought to God, and they lived off of that. Their whole lives centered around their duty and their work for God. They were different than all the rest of God's chosen people because they were the ones handling the sacrifices and the offerings. They could go nearest to God's presence. And now you, you get to go nearest to God's presence. You get to give your whole life, as Paul says, as a living sacrifice. This is what Peter means when he says you're going to give spiritual sacrifices. It's not a grain offering. It's not a burnt offering. It's not an animal offering, a physical offering. It's a spiritual sacrifice. It is our very lives All of it, every piece of it, every minute of our lives, every ounce of our being is to be given to God as a sacrifice. And even when we do that, we still don't deserve the amount of grace and mercy he's given us. And so Peter says, when he's writing, he's he's writing during a time when, when following Jesus isn't that popular. And in fact, remember, it's Peter and John who kind of get chased around and and get told that if they don't quit preaching this Jesus resurrection thing, it, it will be the end of them. And one day it would be. But there were 
where Peter writes that we are part of the holy priesthood, he urges us with instructions. He says in verse 9 of chapter 2, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He keeps writing. He says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war on your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Folks, we are part of the royal priesthood for our King Jesus and our lives as a living sacrifice will look immensely different than the rest of the world. In a day and age in which every year the new censuses that come out and the new studies show that by the hundreds of thousands there are fewer and fewer Christians within this land, we will continue to look stranger and stranger than the culture around us. And that is the way God designed it. Because it's not just part of our lives that's for him. As his priests, it's all. Of your life. And you are the messengers for Jesus. Amen. And so, as we prepare to come to the table today, in, in the nine o'clock service, Ruth still sang a solo, and it was absolutely beautiful. It was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it was incredible because the congregation sang with her. And it might have been the first time in my entire life that the song was sung, not because little kids were walking around or it was time for a children's moment or it was being taught to little kids, but it was being sung because deep down, it's the truth. There was a pastor who once said, you want to know what a church believes, listen to what they sing. You want to know how devoted they are to God, listen to how loud they sing it. But when we sing Jesus loves me, you can sing it softly, you can sing it boldly, sing it joyfully, you can sing it with tears in your eyes. And it's because when we sing that song, it reminds us of coming to this table. Because you, dear Christian, God made you so that he could love you. You were created so that God could love you. The Bible tells me so. His embrace of you is the point of your whole life. There is nothing better in this world to feel and to know the warmth of God's embrace over you. And there are times where we don't feel it. And there are times when we don't believe he should be holding on to us. But when we come to this table, and we hold on to this bread and this cup, we hear Jesus say, do this in remembrance of me. He wants you to know, 
to know that his love is yours, even when you're numb and you don't think you deserve it. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we gather this morning at your table. A table that holds a remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And we come with heavy burdens. We, we come with joyful hearts. We come with tearful eyes. But we come because your love is great for us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless this bread and this cup, that it would fill us physically and spiritually, reminding us that, yes, Jesus loves us. Amen. The Bible told us so. It's in his name we pray. Amen.